superhero at undergraduates do 3,000 things at 150%. As the breaking news feed title suggests, the piece on the face of it is anecdotal and seemingly lighthearted, a collegiate or please believe it or not, about the overscheduled lives of today's Harvard undergrads. More than ever, it would appear, these poised, high-achieving, fantastically driven and disciplined students routinely juggle intense academic studies with what can only seem, at least to an older generation, a truly dizzy-making array of extracurricular activities, free professional internships, world-class athletics, investigative journalism, social and political advocacy, startup companies, <coughs> volunteering for nonprofits, research assistantships, eating clubs, peer advising, musical and dramatic performances, podcasts and video making, and countless other no doubt virtuous and resume building uh, activities, pursuits. The pace is so relentless and competitive, students say, some plan their packed daily schedules down to the minute, i.e. shower at 7.21 a.m. to 7.24 a.m. Others confess to getting by on uh, two or three hours sleep uh, during term, term time. Especially over the past decade or so, it would seem the average Harvard undergraduate has morphed into a sort of lean, glossy, turbocharged super hamster. Look at the page and all you see where the treadmill should be, a beautiful blur. I'm curious if my Stanford students' lives are likewise chalk a block, and indeed Washington and Jefferson students too. Um, heads nod yes, deep sighs are expelled. Their own lives are similarly frenetic. They can barely keep up, they say, particularly given all the texting and tweeting and cell phoning they have to do from hour to hour too. Do they mind? Not hugely, it would seem. True, they are mildly intrigued by Lambert's suggestion in the article that the explosion of busyness is in fact a relatively recent historical phenomenon, and that over the past 10 or 15 years or so, uncertain economic conditions, plus a new cultural emphasis on marketing oneself to future employers, have led to ever more extracurricular add-ons. Yes, they allow you do have to show off your well-roundedness once you graduate. That is, engage in a kind of energetic self-branding, thus the super fox, super size CVs. You'll be needing, after all, to advertise a catalog of competencies, your diverse intellectual and artistic interests, original turn of mind, ability to work alone or in a team, time management skills, enthusiasm, unflappability, not to mention your altruism and moral probity, generosity to those less fortunate, lovable, neat, cute, quirkiness, and pleasure in the simple things of life, such as synchronized swimming, competitive dental flossing, and Antarctic exploration. You're a tough crowd, this whole row is like... <laughs> done with an eye toward resumes, one Harvard assistant dean of students observes, but learning outside the classroom through extracurricular opportunities is a vital part of the undergraduate experience here. Extracurriculars are now as important as coursework, an emeritus professor from the Ed School of Pines. I wouldn't have said that 40 years ago. Yet such references to the past truly a foreign country to most undergraduates ultimately leave my students unimpressed. They all laugh when I tell them that during my own somewhat damp Jurassic era <laughs> undergraduate years, spent in a tiny, obscure, formerly Methodist school in the rainy Pacific Northwest between 1971 and 1975, I never engaged in a single activity that might be described as extracurricular in the contemporary sense. Not, that is, unless you count the little work-study job I had toward the late evenings in the sleepy campus library. What was I doing all day? Studying and going to class, to be sure. Reading books, listening to the stereo, all of that. Falling in love, or at least thinking about it. Eating longer tuna melt sandwiches. But also, I confess, I did a lot of plain old sitting around, if not outright malingering. I've got a box of musty journals to prove it. After all, nobody even exercised in the 
done that. We were also countercultural back then, especially in the Pacific Northwest, when the early 70s were still the late 60s, possibly the 1860s. <laughs> <laughs> the students now regard me with curiosity and vague apprehension. <laughs> what planet is she from? But I have another question for them. While the author of Nonstop obviously admires the multi-talented, multitasking type of undergrad that Harvard attracts, he also worries about the intellectual, emotional, and indeed physical costs of such all-consuming busyness. In a sudden turn uh, toward gravitas, and this is the Harvard magazine writer, uh, he quotes the French film director Jean Renoir's observation that, quote, the foundation of all civilization is loitering, unquote, and wonders aloud if unstructured chunks of time aren't necessary for creative thinking. Quote, if Renoir is right and Harvard students are among the leaders of the future, then civilization is on the precipice. Loitering is fast becoming the lost art, and while careful to phrase his concerns ever so delicate, this is the Harvard alumni magazine, after all. He seems afraid that one reason today's students are so driven and compulsive is that they have been trained up to it since babyhood. From preschool on, they are accustomed to their parents pushing them ferociously to make use of every spare minute. Contemporary middle class parents, uh, themselves often highly accomplished professionals, quote, groom their children for high achievement, he suspects, in ways that set in motion the culture of scheduled lives of non-stop activity. He quotes a former dean of student life, quote, this is the play date generation. There was a time when women, uh, women <laughs> uh, children came home from school and just played randomly with their friends out in the traffic, <laughs> always suggested, or hung around and got bored and <coughs> that would lead you on to something. Kids don't get to do that now. Busy parents put them into things constantly. Violin lessons, bathroom lessons, swimming teams. The kids get the idea that someone will always be structuring their time for them, unquote. Current dean of freshmen concurs. Starting at an early age, students feel that their free time should be filled up with purposeful activities. There is less stumbling on things you love and they give you a fire in your belly, and more being steered toward pursuits, quote unquote. Some of my students begin to look downright uneasy. They are now listening hard. Such parental development <coughs> can be distasteful, even queasy making, the editor writes. Now parents routinely help them with assignments, making teachers wonder whose work they are really grading. Once, college applicants typically wrote their own applications, including the essays. Today, an army of high-paid consultants, coaches, and editors uh, is available to orchestrate and massage the admissions effort. Nor do such parents give up their busybody ways, apparently, once their offspring has landed a prized birth at some desired institute of higher learning. Indeed, writes Lambert. Parental engagement, even in the lives of college-age children, has expanded in ways that would have seemed bizarre in the recent past. Some colleges have actually created a dean of parents position, whether I identify as such as or not, to deal with them. The helicopter parents who hover over nearly every choice or action of their offspring have given way to snowplow parents who determinedly clear a path for their child and shove aside any obstacle they perceive in the way of them. Now, as a professor, I have had some experience with helicopter parents. And were the weather patterns on the West Coast slightly more rigorous, I'm sure I would have encountered snow parents as well. Indelibly etched on my brain, I tell the class, is a phone call I received one winter break from the aggrieved mother of a student to whom I had given a C minus in the course. Now, the class would be a graduate course, this is at Stanford, a PhD seminar, no less. The woman's daughter, a first year PhD student, had spoken nary a word in class, nor had she ever visited during office hours. Her seminar paper had not been impressive. Indeed, it was one of those. 
those for which the epithet gobsmackingly incoherent <laughs> might seem to have been invented. But still, the mother lamented. Her daughter was distraught. The poor child had done nothing over the break but cry and brood and wander by herself in the woods. I had ruined everybody's Christmas, apparently. So what I not repeat myself now by allowing her daughter to rewrite the seminar paper for a higher grade? It was only fair. While startled to get such a call, I confessed to being cowed by this direct maternal assault, and against my academic better judgment said, okay. <laughs> the student did rewrite the essay, and this time I gave it be pretty generous, I thought. It was better, but still mostly incomprehensible. Yet the ink was hardly dry when the mother called again. Why wasn't her cherished daughter receiving an A? She had rewritten the paper. Surely I realized, etc., etc. One was forced to feign the gruesome sounds of a fa fatal choking fit just to get off the telephone. <laughs> Did such hands-on parental advocacy, I inquire, trouble my stand for the students? I call her obviously represented an extreme instance, but what do they think about the minor phenomenon? After all, having internalized images of themselves, if only unconsciously, as the standard bearers of parental ambition, uh, or so the alumni magazine had it, the undergrads of Harvard did not seem particularly embarrassed by Ma and Pa's lobbying efforts on their behalf. According to one survey cited in the piece, only five to six percent of students felt their parents would be too involved in the college admission process. Once matriculated, and now there's an interesting word, most students took regular parental contact and constant maternal paternal advice as completely normal. A third of all Harvard undergrads reported calling or messaging daily with a parent. Yet here it is, or was, just at this delicate point of, that I find myself reduced, however, briefly to speechlessness, blindsided. So how often do my students, all mostly senior English majors, living in the Stanford residential dorms, text or talk to their parents, broad smiles all around, embarrassed looks at one another, whispers and some excited giggling, a lot. <coughs> well, how much exactly? A lot. <laughs> but what's a lot? They can't believe I'm asking. Why do I want to know? I might as well be asking them how often they masturbate. And then it all comes tumbling out. Oh, like every day, uh, sometimes more than once. At least two or three times a day, brood laughter. <laughs> My father emails me jokes and stuff every day. My mother would worry if I didn't call her every day, nodding heads. Well, we're always in touch. My parents live nearby, so I go home most weekends, too. Finally, one student, a delightful young woman, whom I know to be smart, conscientious, and level-headed, confesses that she talks to her mother on the cell phone at least five, maybe six, even seven times a day. We're like best friends, so I call her whenever I get out of class. She wants to know about my professors. <laughs> <laughs> what was the exam? So I tell her what's going on and give her, you know, updates. Sometimes my grandmother is there too, so I talk to her too. I'm stunned. I'm aghast. I am half gaga. I must look fairly stricken too, a lecture keeping over the corpse of Agamemnon, because now the whole class starts laughing at me. Their strange, unfathomable lady professor, the one who doesn't own a television and obviously doesn't have any kids of her own. What a freak. But when I was in school, I managed finally to gasp. We despised our parents. In fact, I splutter. Uh, and uh, we never called our parents. All we wanted to do was get away from our parents. In fact, I swatter, and this seems to be the showstopper. We only had one telephone in our whole dorm in the hallway for 50 people. If your parents called, you'd yell from your room, Tell them I'm not here. <laughs> After this last, last outburst, the students too, 
happy. Busy, optimistic Stanford undergrads. So beautiful and good in their unisex t-shirts, hoodies, and J. Crew cargo shorts. So smart, scrupulous, forward-looking, well-meaning, well-behaved, and utterly presentable. Just the best and the nicest, really. Simply cannot imagine the harsh and silent world I am describing. <laughs> At the time, I was not sure why this conversation left me so dumbfounded, but it did. It stayed with me for weeks, and I told numerous friends and colleagues about it, marveling yet again at the bizarreness of contemporary undergrad life. One said she talked to her mother six or seven times a day. Not so surprisingly, the exchange had reawakened in me, in the moment, a fairly dismal psychological sensation I felt with regard to teaching before, but have typically been loath to acknowledge, so out of step with official norms does it seem. Namely, that sometimes teaching makes me feel lonely. Not all the time, but enough to notice. Lecturing before a class, I will suddenly feel utterly and painfully bereft. A cloud goes over the sun. Though putatively in charge, I am suddenly estranged from my charges, self-conscious, alone in a tunnel, as it were, the object of their attention and somehow obscurely responsible for everything that is taking place, but unable to speak a language anyone understands. I feel sad and oppressed, smothered, unable to breathe. It's the kind of sensation one might have in an anxiety dream, in fact, the sort in which you feel abandoned and overwhelmed and without something you desperately need. They've gone away and left me in charge of everything. At least in my own head, it's the sensation of orphanhood. One rallies, of course, I assure you. Professor freak out, soldiers on, and after a while the feeling goes away. The business of the day returns. But the psychological crowd, cloud can remain for a while a peculiar miasma over existence. By asking myself, my students, a lot of intrusive and impertinent questions, I concluded afterwards, I clearly brought such a mood on myself. Their charming, fresh-faced, matter-of-fact responses, yes, they were just as busy as their Harvard counterparts, but yes, they also managed to take stay in surprisingly close touch with parents, i.e. they were loved and they loved and were loved in turn, had somehow triggered my orphan reflex. I had only myself to blame. I chastised myself for having temporarily forgotten that students today, and not those just at Harvard or Stanford, of course, live in a new, exciting, exacting, 24-7 world, one utterly unlike mentality-wise, the one I inhabited as an undergrad. They seem reasonably content with their lot. In fact, appear to take for granted the endless connectivity, all the networking, Skype interviews, Facebook posts, and pressurely scheduled playdates. And why shouldn't they? Have they ever known anything else? None of it made me happy, but neither was I particularly happy with myself. Now, lest one wonder, I should say up front, I am not an orphan, or at least not in the official sense. At time of writing, both my parents are still alive, alive in their mid-80s, but frail, beginning to fail. They don't live together. In fact, despite residing less than a mile apart, they haven't laid eyes on one another for almost 40 years, not even by accident in the right name store. Don't ask. They have had five rancorous marriages between them. I haven't seen my father more than 10 or 12 times over the past decade. But my recurrent sense of psychic estrangement, not to say shock that my students hooked in, booked up, endlessly bountiful lives, might be some, in some way connected with these jolly aged peas, is a topic that would no doubt need a castle of shrinks to explore thoroughly. But even without reference to a private psychodrama, I think I can now begin to explain, at least intellectually, why my students' overscheduled lives, so paradoxically conjoined, I felt, with intense bonds with the parents, discombobulated me so thoroughly. I've got a conceptual grip, at least, found what Freud calls the onphalos, the 
nothing but the dream, the repressed content. And if I might indulge in a grotesque and no doubt tasteless metaphor, blame it on the aforementioned segment, I should now attempt to wrap hell down to it, using a not so deeply detached umbilical cord as my delay wrote. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, orphanhood, that painful thing, has everything to do with the case. Orphanhood conceived that is in the broadest and most emblematic sense as a metaphor for modern human experience, as a symbol for unhappy consciousness, an emblem of that groundwork, that inaugural experience of metaphysical solitude that Martin Heidegger deemed necessary for the act of philosophizing. About orphanhood conceived, in other words, as a condition for world making, as both the sorrow and creative quintessence of life. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, I realize, so let me explain it in some simpler terms. If you teach the history of English and American literature, as I have done for most of my life, it's pretty safe to say you will end up as, among other things, a state-of-the-art orphan expert. Not that it's that hard. You don't need to go very far back in literary history, after all, to find a plethora of orphan or quasi-orphan protagonists. At the outset of the play bearing his name, Hamlet, or the might, might best be understood, after all, as a sort of half-orphan, indeed, as a half-orphan with a wish to become a full-service orphan. If not downright matricidal, he seems aggrieved enough by his parents, his mother's perceived betrayals to wonder if hastening her demise might not make life at Elsinore Castle rather more enjoyable for everybody concerned. And what is Milton's paradise lost? Oh, that thought. All right, hands and make sure it doesn't go to sleep somehow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. And what is Milton's paradise lost, if not one of Western culture's great parables of self orphaning? Uh, along with the Orstein and the Oedipus plays, it's a sort of poetical primer on how to disorder, I mean, really fuck up the sacred compact. God and man, break fundamental taboos, forfeit the love and care of one's creator in a few outrageous, easy to follow steps. Satan's not really to blame for the mess. He's just a pigment, a kid, uh, the kid who sticks chewing gum on the table leg. Adam and Eve know perfectly well what they are doing when they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They want to eat it. And when they are seeing misery ridden, leaving life in the garden, uh, behind they, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow through Eden that took their solitary way. They carry with them all the pathos of suddenly abandoned children. They have no mother, one presumes, and now their father is dead to them. Worse yet, they are wise orphans. They recognize their own culpability in their loss. Cosmically amplifying their sorrow is the sickening but now no way back knowledge that they brought their banishment on themselves. Yes, Daddy took the T-bird away, but we never should have been driving it in the first place. Still, it is in classic English and American fiction in the novel, say, from Daniel Defoe, Henry Fielding to Dickens, Elliot Twain, James Wolfe, Forster, Hemingway, and the rest, that the orphaned or semi-orphaned hero or heroine becomes a central, if not inescapable, fixture. Something about the new social and psychic world in which the realist novel comes into being in the late 17th, early 18th century pushes the orphan to the foreground of the mix, makes of him or her a strikingly necessary figure, a kind of exemplary being. And by orphan, I also include here those characters called the pseudo-orphans, who believe themselves to be orphans, but over the course of a narrative discover a mother or father or both. So distinctly have these one-of-a-kind characters been drawn, we often know them by a single nickname, name or nickname, Maul, Tom, Becky, Fanny, Heathcliff, Jane, Pip, Oliver, Ishmael, Natty, Huck, Dorothea, Jude, Isabel, Daisy, Millie, Lily, Molly, Sula, 
love. Even if you haven't read the books in which such invented beings appear, you've probably heard of them and their stories. You may even have a rudimentary uh, sense of what they're like as people. So, reliant, footloose, attractive, curious, quick thinking, lucky, tricky, possibly mystic makers, the proverbial black sheep, and so on. Intriguingly enough, Orphan and protagonists appear with alarming regularity in novels and stories written explicitly for children. Witness the celebrated Little Goody Two Shoes, Pollyanna, Heidi, Little Orphan Annie, Kim, Mowgli, Bilbo, Frodo, Anne of Green Gables, Dorothy, she and Toto, and yeah, Peter as in Pam, Harry as in Potter. And needless to say, these parentless juveniles are usually the heroes or heroines of the books in which they appear. They may be wounded or fey or uncanny. What do we make of the vacant circles that little orphan Annie has for eyes? Yet they are also resilient, charismatic, and oddly powerful. And thus the first of the two big lit crit hypotheses I'm going to advance here. Uh, more than love, sex, courtship, and marriage, more than inheritance, ambition, rivalry, or disgrace, more than hatred, betrayal, revenge, or death, orphanhood, the absence of a parent, the frightening yet galvanizing solitude of the child, may be the defining or deep fixation of the novel as a genre, what one might call its primordial motive or matrix, the conditioning psychic reality out of which the form itself develops. Now, even though I've made a talking point of it, what's important here is not only the mere frequency with which orphan heroes and heroines show up in prose fiction. Yes, from Ian Watts, the rise of the novel onward, the phenomenon has been noted and inspired some brilliant critical commentary. In one of the most profound books on fiction ever written, Tony Tanner's Adultery in the Novel, the author associates the orphan trope with the early novel's tendency toward a kind of diegetic instability, its ambiguous, unsettled, unresolved ongoingness and resistance to closure. Like the prostitute or adventurer, the orphan embodies the new genre's own picaresque or outlaw dynamism. And this is canon. The novel in its origin might almost be said to be a transgressive mode inasmuch as it seems to break or makes or adulterate the ex existing genre expectations of the time. It is not for nothing that many of the protagonists of the early novels are socially displaced or unplaced figures, orphans, prostitutes, adventurers, etc. They thus represent a potentially disruptive or socially unstabilized energy that may threaten directly or implicitly the organization of society, whether by the indeterminacy of their origin, the uncertainty of the direction in which they will focus their unbounded, unbonded energy, or their attitude toward the ties that hold society together and that they may choose to slight or break, unquote. In other words, precisely because the orphan heroes, usually untried, unprotected, disadvantaged, not to mention misinformed or uninformed about his or her parentage, he or she can function as a sort of textual free radical, as plot catalyst and story generator, mixer upper of things, who search for a legitimate identity or place in the world of fiction that once jump starts the narrative and tends to shunt it away from didacticism and any predictable or programmatic unfolding of events. A, a fine and flagrant example of such contravention occurs in Defoe's Ball Flanders, 1719. Here, it is precisely the eponymous heroine's putative orphanhood. She knows only that her mother, whom she presumes to be dead, was a convicted thief and gave birth to her in the prison, which catalyzes mid-novel one of the novel's most uh, titillating, if also outlandish, episodes. Maul's uh, scandalous marriage by the state to her own brother. Only well into their marriage, and she has had several children with him, in fact, will Maul realize that her chatty mother-in-law is also her mother, long ago transported 
to America, which is where Mall is at this point, but now obviously still alive and flourishing. Defoe purports to moralize in Mall Flanders. In his preface, he describes his narrative as entirely free of balloon ideas and immodest terms, and a work, quote, from every part of which something may be learned and some just and religious inference drawn. Uh, yet the very mystery in which Paul's birth is initially shrouded, the convenient lack of any clear-cut parental story, also manages to trigger through some inscrutable narrative magic one of the novel's most perverse and sensational incidents. And what on earth are we meant to learn from it? Don't ever get married in case your spouse is your long-lost brother or sister? But Walt Flanders also illuminates an even more profound aspect of the orphan narrative. It's embedding on a certain hard-boiled psychological realism. Even should you recover your lost or alienated parent, that person is still likely to shock or dismay to be a source of danger or trouble to you. The orphan mentality can persist a last <coughs> post-reunion. Thus, Paul finds out that yes, just as she's been told, her mother is a rattled old jailbird and a thief with the livid mark of the branding iron on her hand. Now, for most of us, such a confirmation, even barring the incestuous ramifications, would be disillusioning, to say the least. Imagine, after years of loneliness and struggle, of longing for a tender parental embrace, you finally miraculously locate your birth mother. She turns out to be a convicted a whore, a liar, or a check kiter, a crystal meth addict. No help there, she's way worse off than I am. Freud famously described the family romance as, quote, the childhood fantasy, actually not a quote, uh, the childhood fantasy that one's parents aren't, in actuality, one's real parents. The one was switched in the cradle, left in a basket on the doorstep, found under a cabbage leaf of the life and that one's real father and mother are persons of great wealth, beauty and high station, a king and queen perhaps, who will someday return to reclaim you and love you in the way that you deserve. He thought that such fantasies, especially likely to develop in children at the birth of a sibling, when anger at the parents for introducing, as it were, such an odious rival into the family circle is at a height. Real parents are disparaged, imagined parents idealized. The scenario in Mall Flanders reads like a cartoon burlesque of the Freudian romance, almost a spoof of it. It's not simply that the lost and found parent turns out to be disappointing and trashy. She's quite shockingly trashy, sneaky, disingenuous, a grifter, a terrible old crumb with false teeth, sleazier than you thought would be possible. Are those synthetic hair extenders? But you're stuck with her, it seems, for life, unless you can find a way to write her back out of the story. If you wanted to be fancy about it, you might dub this familial anti romance the emotional drama of the post enlightenment child. Maul does not cease to be orphaned upon rediscovering her mother. On the contrary, Maul almost immediately abandons the mother and the embarrassing brother husband in order to resume her wayward solitary adventuring. And while she will re-encounter the brother later, indeed inherit the plantation in the new world he and the mother have established, Maul never sees her mother again. The maternal reappearance alters little or nothing in the heroine's inner world. Psychologically speaking, Maul is as alone at the end of the fiction as she was when it started. She's what you might call a self-orphaner, an orphan by default, evasive, secret, secretive, deeply intransigent, one of life's permanent orphans. In the broader, affective, even existential sense that I've deployed the term here then, orphanhood is not necessarily reducible to orphanhood in the literal sense. Metaphorically, one might venture, virtually any main character in the early realist novel might be said to be an orphan, including paradoxically any number of those heroes or heroines who have a living parent or two, or end up getting one, as Maul does. A feeling 
of intractable loneliness, of absolute moral or spiritual estrangement from the group may be all that it takes. You don't need to have lost a mother or father in the conventional sense, in other words, to feel psychically orphaned. Indeed, from a certain angle, and thus my second big lit crit hypothesis, the orphan trope is simply allegorized a fundamental and more disturbing emotional reality in early fiction, a generic insistence in these works on the destructive nature of close kinship ties. The more you read, the more you confront the difficult truth, whatever their status in any given narrative, alive, dead, absent, present, lost, found, the maternal and paternal figures in the early English novel are in toto so deeply and overwhelmingly flawed, so cruel, lost, ignorant, greedy, compromised, helpless, selfish, morally absent, or tragically oblivious to their children's needs, one would seem to be better off without them. You might as well be an orphan. Julia Kristeva remarks somewhere, and my wording is not exact here, but, that in every bourgeois family group, there is one child who has a soul. Of course, we all do. <laughs> uh, and thus, we meet them in novel after novel, not only those who go literally motherless and fatherless, but also the children with souls, who, for precisely that reason, will be persecuted by their foolish parents <coughs> or stand-ins, ostracized, abused, made to submit to some hellish moral and spiritual breathing out. Ruthlessly and perviously, the realistic novels of the 18th and 19th century compulsively foreground this orphaning of the psyche, shape it into parable, and in so doing, I think, dramatize the painful birth of the modern subject, that radically deracinated being, vital yet alone, who goes undefined by caste, class, or membership in the group. And I have a million examples here uh, from 18th and 19th uh, century, which I will skip, um, but you just have to believe me about it. Uh, one can find a, a multitude of such dire mamas and papas in, in 18th and 19th century fiction. They are everywhere in works by Smollett, Bernie, Inchwald, as well as essential feature of the Gothic romances of the 1790s. When it comes to depicting parental filial estrangement, the Brontes, the whole bloody lot of them, don't know when to stop. Ditto, Thackeray and Dickens. And while deceptively easygoing in tone, Jane Austen's novels contain an indictment of parents as fraught, arguably, as anything one finds in the Gothic melodramas of Mrs. Radcliffe. Witness of foolish manipulative or otherwise spectacularly unsatisfactory mothers and fathers in North Anger Abbey, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park, Emma, Persuasion. Austin typically nails the inadequacy, even malice, of her fictional parents by festooning them with comic trappings. We laugh at the absurd Mrs. Bennett, the whinging Mr. Woodhouse, even the monstrous Sir Walter Elliot, the vain, pomaded, Liberace-like, grotesquely rank-obsessed father of Anne Elliot, heroine of persuasion. Mothers, it seems, are often long dead in Austin, and as in many other works by women from the period, the heroine is obliged to live with a cold, oppressive, or dissociated father. In real life, having any of these nar narcissistic, non-grown-ups for a parent would be a nightmare come true. How can Emma, after all, a coruscating, brilliant, robust kind, be the child of the dull, mewling, psychotically self-centered Mr. Woodhouse? Austin's heroines are often especially changeling right, changeling like, sleek, witty, perceptive misfits who appear to <coughs> integrated into whatever usually produced version of the family unit the novelist has uh, devised for them. What to do with parents who failed us so abysmally? Perhaps the most drastic solution is to imagine a fictional world finally from which parents have simply been erased, psychically blanked out, absolutely and long in 
advance of any narrative unfurling. The hostility toward parent figures that we find here reaches a certain glassy-eyed apogee in those works, Bleak, Bleak, and Bleaker, in which the protagonist mother and father are, as it were, simply disappeared. So thoroughly repressed, textually speaking, that most of us don't even stop to wonder about them. Unthinkingly, reflexively, we accept the boy where they should be. Uh, and Charlotte Bronte, I think, is the great master of this. Um, Jane Eyre, Lucy Snow, and Villette. Um, in Villette, her mother and father are never even mentioned, but she is alone uh, from the first uh, page of that novel onward. Uh, it's as if um, the, the characters themselves have arisen out of nowhere into a world in which estrangement, loss, silence about the past appear to be the necessary preconditions for narrative itself. So you may be wondering, I've skipped to many more examples, so you may be wondering, what does any of this gloomy business have to do with my frantic, ambitious, maddening, multitasking students, with helicopter moms and dads, with so-called Velcro parents who want to keep you messaging 24-7? Surely I don't wish to link all the ultra-depressing things one discovers in art literature, oh, the horror, the horror, etc., with the banal addictive and anodyne back and forth of contemporary student life. Hello, you have 193 new messages. Checking some software updates for startup disks on the school. Hey, it's Mom. I was just wondering if you had time yet to, or do I? My answer must be both circumspect <laughs> and extremely speculative. I don't wish, on the one hand, to sound like someone simply nostalgic for <coughs> pain, a relic, a loneliness, a loneliness junkie, a cheerleader for real-world orphanhood, or when you get right down to it, a proponent of Orestes-style matricide or patricide, not usually anyway. On the other hand, however, I can't help but wonder if we haven't all lost the thread a bit when it comes to understanding what a higher education ideally should entail. College officials yammer on these days about the need of students to develop something they piously call critical thinking and thereby gain some kind of intellectual autonomy of foothold on adulthood. But I'm wondering if it isn't time to reaffirm the idea that, that critical thinking begins at home, or, began, or better, with home, which is to say that each one of us at some point needs to think dispassionately and daringly about the homes from which we emerge and what we really think of them. Yes, there it is. Do you owe your parents your obedience, your deference, your love, your phone calls? The questions sound harsh because they are. But our sight written times may require some harshness. The illustration above is Francisco Goya's sublime, horrific masterpiece, Kronos Devouring His Son, one of the infamous black paintings the artist nearing the end of his life painted on the walls of his house between 1819 and 1823. It depicts a horrifying event in mythology, <coughs> the cannibalistic murder by the primeval titan god Kronos, Saturn in the Roman version of one of his children, having received the prophecy that he will be overthrown by one of his own offspring, Kronos eats for each of his first five sons at birth. His wife, Ox, however, saves their sixth son, Zeus, by hiding him away on Crete and feeding Kronos a stone in swaddling clothes in place of the newborn. Kronos is fooled, and later this same Zeus, father of the new Olympian gods, overthrows his father just as predicted. An image to shock and awe, undoubtedly, but also one of the great paintings made in that period called the Enlightenment, that revolutionary era, roughly 1660 to 1820, during which, for better or for worse, Western culture began to shake off some of the more baleful and stultifying aspects of the Judeo-Christian past and reimagine itself as modern. The central insight of the period, it's so familiar to us perhaps that we 
we have lost sight of this momentousness, that individual human beings are endowed with critical faculties and powers of moral discernment, and as a result have a right, if not the obligation, to challenge oppressive, unjust, and degrading patterns of authority. Over the course of the 18th century and into the 19th and 20th, more and more educated men and some women felt empowered enough to criticize previously sacrosanct received ideas, traditional religious beliefs, established rules of government, accepted modes of social, legal, and economic organization, the conventional dynamics of family life, relations between men and women, adults and children, all those cognitive grids, so to speak, through which we customarily make sense of the world. In his iconic essay of 1784, Basis Alfaro, What is Enlightenment? Immanuel Kant put it thus, Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another. This immaturity is self-incurred if its cause is not lack of understanding, but lack of resolution and courage to use it without the guidance of another. The motto of enlightenment is sapere aude, have courage to use your own understanding. Not that Kant imagined cultural enlightenment or personal enlightenment to be easy or bloodless, especially given the seemingly attractable human proclivity for business as usual. Quote, laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large proportion of men, even when nature has long emancipated them from alien guidance, nevertheless gladly remain immature for life. For the same reasons, it is all too easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians. It is so convenient to be immature. If I have a book to have understanding in place of me, a spiritual advisor to have a conscience for me, a doctor to judge my diet for me, and so on. I need not make any efforts at all. I need not think, so long as I can pay, others will soon enough take the tires and job over for me. Unquote. I confess I read these words first over 25 years ago, and they never cease to thrill me. I understand the orphan narratives of, of literature in the same way I do Goya's painting, as an image designed to shock us into critical thinking about those titanic figures we call our parents and the larger cultural and social forms they so often wittingly or unwittingly represent. The intimate authority of parents, after all, is the first kind of authority most of us experience. The parental command, the first utterance we recognize as that which must be obeyed. Pain and suffering we learn will result from disobedience, and soon, about, uh, soon enough, most of us become an adept at shaping our wishes according to a system of superimposed demands. We learn as young children to control the way we eat, drink, and eliminate waste. We learn to clean our own bodies. We learn under what circumstances it is appropriate to yell or scream or cry when we must be silent. Later on, adult society will impose further, even more complex demands. Thus, we internalize all those second order codes of behavior associated with the educational, uh, political, religious, economic, and commercial domains within which we all attempt to function. Yet, might it not be the case that true advances in human culture, the real leaps in collective understanding, typically come about as a result of some maverick individual action, some fundamental disobedience on the part of the subject. Such maverick actions are often disturbing precisely because they need to get our attention. We have to be jolted out of complacency. The greatest artists almost invariably disrupt and disturb in this way. Like many novelists I've been describing, Goya gives us a shocking scene of intergenerational violence, but he does so precisely to force us to confront some of the deepest and hardest feelings we may have about parental authority and its rightful scope, about family violence, about the power of the old over the young, the role of paternalism in society and government, about whether or not those people we designate as fathers, priests, doctors, political leaders, scientists, or 
mothers, nurturers, apple pie makers, self-sacrificing soccer moms, iPhone, FaceTime partners, mama grizzlies. Do they really know best about? We need to know whether it is incumbent upon us to exert ourselves against them. You don't have to be a professor, I think, to see that Goya is horrified by a certain bestial, all-absorptive, soul-destroying kind of parental authority, a radical naysayer. Uh, the focus in the Kronos painting, move to the last slide, yeah. <clears throat> in the Kronos painting is on paternal despotism, but elsewhere in Goya's oeuvre, we can find a frightful <coughs> to a murderous mother's notably in Los Caprichos, a suite of fantasy engravings depicting monsters, witches, crones, goats, and owls, all engaging in child torture of different kinds. The questions Goya raises remain awful and unremitting more than 200 years later. Is the rule of life eat or be eaten, even if what you consume is your own child? One of the most terrible things about Kronos devouring the sun is surely the fact <laughs> Sorry. No, I just want to try to go back for one second to uh, Kronos. Uh, but Kronos, the power of son, his son, is surely the fact that the headless child here has the proportions not of a newborn infant, but of an adult human being. Should we resist our creator's authority when and how and why? Or should we let ourselves be murdered in his name when and how and why? Such questions uh, lie in the heart of great literature. In its most serious and masterful incarnations, what the early novel dramatizes, it seems to me, is nothing less than a radical transformation in human consciousness, a new idea. For better or for worse, the passionate, fierce, and liberating notion embedded in the early novel is that parents are there to be fooled and defied, especially in matters relating to erotic object choice. Uh, so many of these books are marriage plots in which the parents represent uh, kind of the traditional authority of the arranged marriage. The children represent a new individualist ethos <coughs> of romantic love. The, the most vener venerated traditions exist to be broken with. The creative power is rightly vested in the individual rather than and in the young rather than the old, that thought is free or should be. The assertion of individual rights can reluctantly begin symbolically in every other way with the primal rebellion of the child. So where are we today? Are we in the midst of some counter-transformation? A rolling back of the enlightenment parent-child story? Are we returning to the older model of belief, to a more explicitly authoritarian and indeed elder-centric world. The latter model, uh, elder-centric, has dominated most of human history, after all, for the Enlightenment. Maybe the Enlightenment break with the age old commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, was temporary, an aberration, just a blip on the screen. My own views remains, my own view remains predictably twisty, fraught, and disloyal. Parents, in my opinion, have to be finessed thought around, even as we love them. They are so colossally wrong about so many important things. And even when they are not, paradoxically, even when they are set right, the imperative remains the same. To live an adult life, indeed to live a creative and meaningful life, it is necessary, I would argue, to engage in a kind of self-orphaning. The process will be different for every person, of course. I'm almost done here. Uh, I have my own inspirational cast of characters in this regard, a set of willful, heroic, self-orphaners, past and present, whom I have always admired and continue to revere. Mozart, the musical child prodigy, who successfully rebelled against an insanely grasping and narcissistic father, who for years shocked him around the courts of Europe as a sort of family cash cow. Sigmund Freud, who by way of unflinching self-analysis, discovered that it was indeed possible to love and hate something or someone at one and the same time. Uh, <clears throat> mothers and fathers included, and that such painfully mixed emotion was also inescapably human. Virginia Woolf, who in 
spite of childhood loss, mental illness, an acute sense of the sex prejudice she saw everywhere around her, not only forged a life as one of our greatest modernist writers, but also made her own life as much as she could, and an incorrigibly honest and vulnerable one. In a journal entry finally from 1928, uh, collected in the writer's diary, Wolf wrote the following about her brilliant, troubled, tyrannical, enormously distinguished father, Sir Leslie Stephen, one of the great English men of letters of the 19th century, the model for the mawkish, manipulative, endlessly demanding Sir Ramsay into the White House. She writes, father's birthday, he had died uh, sometime earlier. He would have been 96, 96, yes, today, and could have been 96, like other people one was known, but mercifully was not. His life would have entirely ended mine. What would have happened? No writing, no books. Inconceivable. Unquote. The current sentimental pathology of the American middle class family, not to mention the mind warping digitalization of everyday life, militates against such ruthlessness and candor. But what the life of the orphan teaches us, teaches me at least, is that it is indeed the self-conscious affirmation of one's inheritance, the making strange of received ideas, the cultivation of a willingness to defy, debunk, or just plain old <coughs> disappoint one's parents, that is the absolute precondition now more than ever for any sort of intellectual, emotional, and moral freedom.